Hey Snackers, in episode 39 of DevNet Snack Minute, Matt and Kareem chat with Grace Francisco, the new VP of Developer Relations, Strategy, and Experience at Cisco. They discuss the growing importance of developer relations and the opportunities of a cloud-first world. Hey everyone, Matt DiNapoli here. I'm one of the managers of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a tech advocate with Cisco Learning and Certification. Welcome to episode 39 of DevNet Snack Minutes. DevNet Snack Minute is your weekly 10-minute all things DevNet, giving you a quick, fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding, and just some cool stuff that we do at DevNet. And the cool thing that we're going to be talking about today is developer relations with our very special guest, Grace. Uh, Grace, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Well, hello, Snackers. My name is Grace Francisco of Cisco. I love saying that now. And because this is a snack minute, I brought snacks. I brought popcorn. You're the first one. Awesome. You're the first one. We don't even <laughs> eat snacks on snack minute. We should do that, Kareem. <laughs> yeah, we should. I think every guest from now on should bring a snack. <laughs> we agree. We agree. I'm actually kind of hungry right now. It's around lunchtime. Um, so, cool. Grace, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Kareem, why don't you start it off with Grace? Yeah, sure, Grace. Uh, appreciate your time here. Your charter within developer relations at DevNet is new for Cisco. Can you give us some insights on your vision for developer relations and opportunity for Cisco, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, and I got sidetracked on my intro because of the popcorn piece. So I am uh, new to Cisco. I've been here for about a quarter now, and uh, I am the VP of Developer Relations Strategy and Experience. And what that means for me is my charter includes DevNet. And you guys have done, and the whole team, guys and gals have done a, an incredible job of building this program that takes our community of network engineers and infrastructure engineers and DevOps folks and bringing them to a programmable world across all of our many API opportunities that we have across Cisco. And that is amazing. My charter is much broader than that, which includes also shepherding Cisco to this world of developers who are building for a cloud first world and making sure that they're aware of the many opportunities that we have for them on our cloud native stack. So that's uh, in a nutshell what my, my charter is all about. And I'm super, super happy to be working with the DevNet team. Um, and they've just, this kind of stuff, the snack minutes, I love the work that's been happening already. Thank you, oh, thank you for that, Grace. Uh, we, we put a lot of time and effort into this, so I appreciate that you appreciate it. So as part of this charter, it sounds like you've made developer empathy an important part of it. Um, can you tell us kind of what, how you, what you mean by developer empathy and then how that actually plays into driving developer relations, potentially at Cisco, but you know, in the industry as a whole? Sure. When I think about developer relations, I always think about the capital R in relations. And in order to really build strong relationships with those developers that you are working with in your current community and other communities you're reaching out to, it really starts with empathy. And to be really empathetic and understand the needs, the challenges, the pain points of the developers and their work from day to day, you really have to put your ear to the ground pretty regularly and understand, you know, who are they? Where are they coming from? What tools are they using? What do they like? What they don't like? And so that's a really big focus area for myself and our organization, as you know, Matt. Um, it's it's super important for us to really build those ongoing touch points and communications. And I know we do some of that, but I want to do even more. And I want to make sure that we're we're spending a lot of time on our developer site, having a really great experience with helping people along their adoption path. I remember in the old days, and Kareem will remember this, um, a lot of our developer docs were in PDFs and they were hidden <laughs> in various ah, Cisco sites. No. Yeah, exactly. It was crazy. I've had that um, so we, somewhere else too. Yeah. Yeah, it was nuts. And so uh, one of the driving things for developer empathy um, at the beginning of DevNet was, hey, let's at least get our documentation into one spot and in HTML. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is so funny that you bring that up. That brings back memories of a place that I was at where, and I won't name the name of the, the place, and they were a lovely company to work for, but I walked in and it was a vanilla uh, CMS site that hadn't even been customized to have the reflection of the, the brand and the company and the offering. It was three downloadable PDFs that you would go and <laughs> register and log in for, and they were massive PDFs as well, and um, they, they didn't necessarily get you from A 
to be very easily. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, yep. it wasn't easily accessible and then you had to register. Sometimes you also had to wait for a salesperson to give you access to try on the APIs, which <laughs> could take months. So a lot of my focus there was really about making it really easy to have access. Documentation should be free and easy to access. So you understand what, what that API is possible, you know, the possibilities of what you can do with that API. And then also, you know, ideally, you also want to have really easy friction-free access to a sandbox environment for those APIs, which we have a great wealth of within our developer site today, which I'm really happy to see. I know the team works really hard to offer that in a friction-free way. That was the second portion of it. It was get documentation up and get people access to hands-on um, experiences with the platforms because before we had to have you know, our partners and customers pay for equipment. And, and now we have those sandboxes. So nice plug on that, Grace, good job. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we run and we run a, a sandbox series in uh, uh, DevNet Snack Minute. So if you, you know, snackers, check it out. Um, one thing to add to that is we've come so far from what the, the APIs we had in those PDFs going from SOAP to a RESTful API and just that transition um, Matt and I were lucky enough to be and to see Cisco transition in that. Um, I remember just handing off like a PDF around the SOAP API and imagining having to navigate that beast just from what we had. So it's it's pretty impressive. Grace, you just wrote an interesting blog post around software is eating the world. Um, why did that piece make such an impact on you then? And what are your thoughts on ten years on, on it ten years later? Yeah, so that was my first blog for Cisco, so go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and I think about Mark Andreessen's statement about software eating the world a lot um, throughout my career. And, and when I was a developer, we were called evangelists back then, not advocates, yes. um, <laughs> at Microsoft. Uh, and I spent eight years there, and I, I had a great wealth of experiences there. That's where I really built my foundation of developer relations experiences. And then I took that to many other companies. Well, when I left there after eight years, I... I remember struggling with what am I going to be when I grow up? I know this is a very strange <laughs> thing to say because I, you know, I was very much grown up at that point, but I didn't really know what to do with my career because only big companies like Microsoft and Apple had roles for developer evangelists. Well, I was very lucky and I, ended up, I landed it into it after my, my career stint at Microsoft. And there I was able to take my craft of developer relations to an organization that was still fairly early on in building a developer relations practice. And then this whole stream of other requests and recruiting uh, things happened to me uh, in the years after that where demand kept growing and growing. And I remember thinking it was all related to Mark basically saying, hey, every company needs to be a software company. And I had this aha moment in a couple of years after that when I was at Yodely after Intuit. And there was a bank, I think it was a bank in, in uh, Spain that published an API and I went, oh, see there, this is why there's so much demand for developers and developer relations people because now I'm getting all these calls and these emails from all these companies, very different kinds of companies, not traditional tech companies saying, hey, can you help me? with this developer relations thing that we don't understand and help us drive adoption for these APIs. And I went, oh, that's all because Mark sort of had this cascading effect with his statement. I mean, it was bound to happen, but I think it had a, a rolling cascading effect after he said that because I think everyone else also had this aha moment of, yes, of course we should have an API. Of course we should make this easier. Of course we should allow people to innovate on our platform. And that has done wonders to my career because I ended up staying in this track and building a whole um, specialty around this. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, it's been an amazing journey through and recently through multiple unicorn companies like Roblox and Atlassian and MongoDB. And now to be here is, is just amazing. That's interesting to have an outside perspective because uh, Kareem and I have gone through this inside Cisco, the same yeah. kind of aha moment, maybe a couple of years later than, than you know, 2010, 2011. Um, but it was it was uh, a little bit of uh, a journey as well, because we had to worry about um, the perception around the world that Cisco is a hardware company and that they don't provide software. Um, but as we looked across the landscape internally, we realized, well, a lot of our collaboration tools at the time um, had all of these cool interfaces uh, into them and it allowed you to extend the way phones worked and the way that you interacted with user management for call center and all those things. And then we saw that kind of 
adoption across enterprise networking and software to, or and um, so, uh, service provider networking and DC networking and then compute. And so it was really exciting over that period of time to see this adoption just within the, the world of Cisco to say, well, yeah, software is a big part of this. Yeah, we still sell boxes and, and hardware is still an important part of it. But that software layer is really interesting and, and allows for those those innovative and revolutionary ideas. It's been think, fun part of it internally absolutely. as well. <laughs> I think the best part for me is, you know, talking to the network engineer and, you know, showcasing APIC EM back then and <laughs> just watching their like mind just who blow is just it's it was just a different experience trying to like working with them and evangelizing the technology from an API and programmability perspective is just a completely different experience from a career perspective. Yeah. So they're smart oven has the APIs as well. So we've got them in toaster ovens and built in ovens and cars. They're everywhere, right? I mean, the, the possibilities of program programmability is everywhere. It surrounds us in everyday life and the yeah. smallest of devices to the largest of devices. And who knows, maybe we'll be able to program something out in space too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. Uh, Grace, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. This is, as you know, the Snack Minutes or Snack Minute. Um, so we got to keep it short and concise. But before we let you go, yep. uh, we ask all of our guests Wait, this very special more question. Popcorn. Oh, more popcorn. More <laughs> popcorn. <laughs> Sorry, more popcorn. <laughs> I'm going to have to run and get some sure. after this. Um, you're yes. going to have a lot of cleaning to do after this, Grace. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> that's commitment. <laughs> um, we do ask, ask all of our guests this very special question. If you um, could pick a superpower, uh, what would it be and potentially why? Uh, that superpower would be probably a magic wand to strike balance in everything in the world today. I find that we get to such extremes in conversations and the way that we react and do things today in our world and it causes so much havoc. I would love a magic wand to help strike balance in everything that we're doing and everything, including how we treat the earth. I mean, our earth is dying mm -hmm. because of the things that we go to extremes on. And I think there, there is a balance to strike across all of these things to, to make things a lot healthier for us globally and, and the earth that we all share. So that, that would be my oh, superpower. That's beautiful. I, I love that one. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, Snackers, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you, Grace, for joining us. And if you'd like to hear more from Grace on developer relations, check out DevNet Create coming in October. Registration is open now. Thanks, Snackers. Thank you.